I use calendula for so many different reasons. It's, I feel like it's one of those plants that people think is really common and it's really simple, but I feel like it's really multidimensional. Hello and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I absolutely love calendula. It's a plant that I adore in my garden and in many of my herbal skin formulas. I was thrilled when Alex chose calendula as her plant for the show, and I loved hearing new ways about working with this favorite plant. For example, she shares a full spectrum extract method that she learned from Chanchal Cabrera. For those of you who don't already know her already, Alex Ray was born in the southern tier of New York among rich farmlands and birch forests. She is a trained community clinical herbalist and a full spectrum doula who is passionate about accessible herbal care and supporting all pregnancy outcomes. Alex was raised around her southern great grandmother, who was a birthing assistant for her mother, who worked as a midwife and herbalist with the Chestnut Ridge people. This may explain her admiration for the plant and reproductive world since childhood. Alex is a queer cis woman. She is the founder of the Community Care Camper, a free mobile herb clinic serving underserved populations in and around Ann Arbor, Michigan. She is the co-owner of the Black Locust Gardens Herb Farm and Plant Nursery, a coordinator for the Great Lakes Herb Fair, an herbal educator, mom, animist, pagan, writer, and is currently working on opening up a mutual aid herb shop. She works on a sliding fee scale, weaving together a harm reduction and client-centered lens. She works mostly with AFAB people around postpartum, pregnancy loss, gut, and hormonal health. You can visit Alex at blacklocusgardens.com. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, I appreciate you being here so much. What no one else knows but us is that it's been a journey to get here together. And so I really appreciate it where you've been having ice storms and power outages and Wi-Fi issues and everything. So, but we did it. We're here. It's working. Yeah. This is going out into the world. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate your perseverance and making it happen. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Well, I would love to start with hearing more about you and your uh, herbal path and what your journey has been like that has brought you here today. Yeah. Well, I think it's a combination of a few things. Um, I was really lucky because I grew up with my great grandparents. Um, they actually didn't pass away until I was 16. Um, and they owned some property in rural Western New York where I grew up. Uh, my grandmother was amazing woman. She was a farmer, an avid gardener, canner, quilter. And her mother, Victoria, my great great grandmother, was a midwife and an herbalist for the Chestnut Ridge people, mm -hmm. which was a small population of people in West Virginia um, that were really ostracized from community. They were like denied access to education and denied access to health care. And as far as I know, Victoria um, helped them deliver babies and helped with health care for them in that region of West Virginia. Um, they were all from the South and actually played um, in a band, a bluegrass band for Eleanor Roosevelt one day in like the 30s. Wow. Um, and they were just amazing. And I remember hearing stories about Victoria because my grandmother, Ladona, her name was, um, would go to these births with her. Um, and so it was just kind of in daily conversation growing up. And plants were too, you know? Um, and I didn't really think about it much. Um, until much later on in life, I kind of started connecting the dots because sometimes I look around and I'm like, how did plants take over my life? <laughs> <laughs> um, in all the best ways possible, right? Um, 
And also, so the area that I grew up was really rural. It was like one little tiny town. And then outside of that is pretty much Amish. And there's the Allegheny National Forest. And then there's a bunch of state forests around as well. Hmm. And um, I had a semi-traumatic childhood. And I found just a lot of solace in those areas, in those forests. Um, And it just kind of always was with me. It was something that kind of happened really young for me everyone's journey and and path is very different. But um, I actually wrote my senior high school paper on the history of herbal medicine. Wow. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And it's funny, my mom is visiting from New York right now, and we were kind of talking about this. And she's like, you were just always asking questions about plants from a really, really young age. Uh Um, Also, where I grew up, there was a pagan community called Brushwood Folklore Center. Um, And I started going there pretty young, around like 13, 14. And the the place is just like really beautiful. And there was all these altars for different elements of, uh, you know, fire, earth, water, um, and a lot of workshops and conversations around plants. Um, And that, I think, shaped me a lot, too, as as who I am today. So I think that's that's like the chunk of it, you know, um, before this might date me, but when I wrote that paper, when I was a senior in high school, there was no Instagram and there was no like herbal, like you couldn't just go online and find out like what herb school to go to. And I knew that I wanted to go to herb school when I was a senior, but I didn't know of any that existed. I think one time I got like a printed thing from Chestnut Ridge School. Um, A lot of my family, my grandparents grew up outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So ever since I was really young, I was going there every year. And I was like, oh, I love this area um, and found out there was an herb school there. Um, I didn't end up going. And then years later, around 2013, I ended up going to Ithaca, New York um, and studying with Seventh Song at the Northeast Mm -hmm. School of Botanical Medicine, which I highly recommend. and then after that, I, uh, I moved to Michigan and I took Jim McDonald's Herbal Intensive, which I also highly recommend. <laughs> Both amazing herb teachers. Um, and I did my doula training. Um, and then I thought I was going to go into nursing school and be a nurse practitioner. But the plants were like, come this way. <laughs> it was like, come this way. Um, and then I kind of ended up sticking with the plants. And here I am. <laughs> I, you know, you, I've met other people who knew from a fairly young age that they were, the plants were calling them, but not, not a lot. Um, But one thing that just strikes me, listen to your stories, I think this is going to be a more common story because, because of herbalism gaining in popularity, because of people raising their children with herbs, that it's just going to be, like you said, like a part of the conversation growing up. And it's just going to seem like a natural pathway. Whereas, you know, before there's been kind of like you had to make the path in order to go and really, you know, struggle to find out where to find your information and who to learn from and all of those sorts of things. So that's going to become more and more normalized, which I think is really cool. Yeah, it's awesome. We need we need all the herbalists and all the plant people that we possibly can get. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I just I had a wondering that I'm just wondering when Victoria was born. Do you know? Oh, man, my mom would definitely know this. Um Probably, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, obviously the 1800s, late Mm -hmm. 1800s, I'm assuming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How wonderful to have that connection to your ancestors and shared memory. And um, I can go back and look at my ancestry, but there's not a lot of like shared memory. It's just names on paper. So what a wonderful thing. Yeah, I feel really, I feel very lucky that I was raised around them. They lived so long too, that I was able to, take that in, you know, um, I do feel like that's really rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, How beautiful. Well, I know that you had a super easy time choosing your herb. (laughs) Oh man. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think it was like the, the dreariness of winter where I was like, Ooh, calendula, (laughs) (laughs) you know, all the ice storms and everything. And I was like, I just want something bright. (laughs) Yeah. What a lovely choice. I'm excited to hear more about calendula from you. Yeah. So here in Michigan, we grow it as an annual. It's a very easy plant to grow. If people are interested, you can start it outside at your, like your last frost date, you know, um, 
I'm not sure where you are in the Pacific Northwest, if it's like a self-seeding annual for you. Um, it's not here in Michigan. It's not super vigorous here. Like yeah. I will get some self-seeding, but I can't count on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same. Um, and otherwise, if you don't have like a heated space to to start them, you can just wait to your last frost date and just have a really nice prep bed and they're happy to just be direct seeded and watered in. Um, and they're so abundant and amazing. Um, and if you have a heated space or like a space in your house to grow them under a light, you know, you could start them earlier and then plant them out as they get bigger. Um, so that's just like a little bit about growing them. I have folks. We have to talk about the seeds, I feel like, because Clint yeah. seeds are so cool. They're For so those cool. of you watching on YouTube, I'll put a photo up. But how would you describe what those seeds look like? Mm, I mean, I want to make jewelry out of them. Yeah. Like they're just like they're so windy, and all of, each of them are just so different, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Gosh, yeah, it's just something that everyone should witness. <laughs> and they're they're huge, and that also really makes it nice for growing and collecting seed yourself because they are so big that you can also just have some plants kind of go to seed and just harvest them off the flowers and keep them for next year too. With calendula, that's how we grow it. We usually grow it in the field of the hoop house. Um, and like I said, they're they're really, really abundant to harvest. And I would say that I use calendula for so many different reasons. It's I feel like it's one of those plants that people think is really common and it's really simple, but I feel like it's really multi-dimensional plant. So I use it for harvesting the, the flowers and the calyx, so the green part of the plant as well, kind of pop those off. And usually they come into flower, we plant them out in June and um, harvest them usually in like July, August is really when they start popping. And then I harvest the, the fresh tops with the green part, so the calyx um, underneath it, and that's all that I harvest. And I would say I use it in so many different ways. Um, first, I dry the flowering tops and I can use that as a sits bath for my postpartum folks, maybe with some like dried yarrow and marshmallow and red raspberry and some sea salt. And that's great for postpartum healing after childbirth, um, as well as people that might have hemorrhoids. Um, I also use it extensively in like any kind of gut healing formulas, um, you know, because it is a vulnerary herb, which which we know is an herb that helps heal skin tissue. Um, it can also help heal like our mucosal membranes. So that consists of like our gut and people that might have issues with like IBS or um, leaky gut syndrome, then I'm gonna put calendula in their tea blend for them to drink. I also really love it as an oil and I use fresh um, flowers. And this took me a while to figure out um, so that all my oils wouldn't go rancid. Um, but I would basically um, put calendula flowers in a mason jar and I'd put a little bit of ethanol alcohol over top of it. So maybe like two, te two teaspoons or two tablespoons, depending on the amount of flowers that I have. Kind of shake that up and let that sit all day or overnight so that the alcohol kind of soaks in and evaporates a bit. And then I'd pour my oil of choice over top of that. And then you can get a really nice, strong calendula oil as well. Calendula, like all plants, has like hundreds and thousands of different chemical constituents. So it's got resins, which pull out with alcohol more so than water or glycerin or an oil. And it has saponins, flavonoids, it's got polysaccharides, which we find in our other immune modulating herbs like reishi or astragalus for some examples. And so calendula, um, in that sense, um, also really does well as an extract in water. So in your teas, you get those polysaccharides and you probably of course get some of those resins as well, but the alcohol is gonna pull those resins out a little bit more. So kind of looping back to like um, the polysaccharides, um, we can use it um, as a full spectrum tincture to be able to get that full spectrum tincture. We can make one tincture that has a high alcohol percentage, say like 95% alcohol, if you can get that where you live, um, or you could um, get some vodka or whatever is available to you. And then you can get make a lower um, alcohol percentage, maybe a 30% with a little bit more water that pulls those polysaccharides out. And then you kind of wait for those to macerate and be done. And then you mix those two to get a really nice full spectrum um, calendula tincture as well. 
Oh, wow. I've never heard of doing that before with calendula. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a really fascinating plant. And I think, um, I think what I love about it too, and this is kind of nice because of spring kind of coming up and is, is it's, it's effects on the lymph system um, and using it as a lymph, lymphagog or a lymphatic herb. Um, so I also really like to use that tincture um, for anyone that might be like having immunosuppressive symptoms. So that basically means someone that is having like, um, you know, they're sick really frequently and they're not feeling better um, as quickly as maybe they should, or they have chronic allergies, um, maybe putting calendula in a formula for them or acute issues as well, um, just to give someone an immune boost, maybe with some echinacea or red root or what, you know, depending on what they're experiencing. Um, I really like to use calendula in that sense as well. And I feel like it's gentle enough, of course, changing the dosage up a little bit to use with kids um, as well for sicknesses or swollen lymph nodes, um, maybe topically as an oil um, or even a couple drops as a tincture. When I do herbal first aid, I really like to carry around like pre-made calendula tea bags. And I like to use that just for like compresses. Um, if anyone has swollen lymphs um, underneath their armpits or their um, in their neck, um, you could do herbal compress. Eye washes are really nice with calendula, irritated red eyes because of that vulnerary action again. Calendula is really useful for um, a face wash to for acne, the antimicrobialness of of calendula. I just feel like there's so many different ways to use calendula. <laughs> and I'm probably forgetting some, <laughs> but there's a lot. I love the calendula in the tea bag tip. That's something I do a lot with chamomile because you can just buy chamomile in tea bags already. Um, so it's a nice, like when I go traveling, I always take some with me for that, you know, those things that might come up, but that's a really great tip for calendula. Yeah. And if you're traveling and if you have like a easily upset stomach, it's like those astringent properties or like those gut healing properties in that calendula, just make it a tea and drink that. And maybe that can help a little bit as well mm -hmm. with, with travel gut, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also appreciated that you were very specific that you uh, harvest the entire flower head with the green mm -hmm. at the bottom because that is one of that is a pet peeve of mine. I don't know why it is, but I'll just you know when the calendula is happening, I'll see on Instagram or social oh. media posts where people are like removing the petals from the green part to make their wow. tinctures or their teas. It's just like a you know like that's something that gets repeated that you, if I'm going to eat calendula, I just use the petals. But that's the only time I just use the petals. Uh, like if I'm going to put calendula in cookies, I don't like put in the green parts, um, for example. But if you're making medicine, and I always tell people when you harvest it, you can tell because you harvest those, your fingers get so sticky tacky with all of those resins. I mean, that's just that's the good stuff in there. Yeah. The good stuff. Yeah. You definitely don't want to take the petals off the calyx for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be tricky to dry to get a good quality of a dried calendula because of that stickiness. It does retain a lot of moisture in that calyx of that, that flower. So just like a really low heat, you know, 95 degrees over a really um, long period of time or short, depending on where you're drying it and how. But there's like this sweet spot with it, you know, where it's like you don't want to pull it too soon because it can hold on to a lot of like moisture in in that specific area of the plant. Um, well, you know, yeah, so you just got to be mindful of that. Yeah, so that, I'm really happy to hear that because I live in a super arid climate, unlike you. And so I don't really use a dehydrator much because it's just super dry here. So people ask all the time, how do I dehydrate it? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> we moved to the desert. Um, like my air is a dehydrator. <laughs> yeah, my air is a dehydrator. Yeah. <laughs> However, I will say that I have to be like very tricky. Like it's tricky though, because I will store it now in paper bags because one time I harvested like um, in this, I had a whole bunch of beautiful primo calendula. I put it in a gallon glass jar that was sealed tight and I swear it was dry. I mean, it was dry, dry, I swear, but it, obviously it was not because it just got covered in mold, uh, which was very, very sad <laughs> for a whole, you know, just have lost that. So, so now I'm very careful with it, but I'm glad you mentioned that it's a bit, a bit tricky there. 
It's a bit tricky. And that's happened to us on our farm, on, on um, the herb farm, is we've harvested like, you know, 20 pounds and then we pull it too soon from the dryers and then it, you know, it goes bad. And we're like, oh, God. <laughs> um, it's only happened like one time, but um, and it happens quickly. You you can figure it out pretty fast, um, which is a good thing. But um, yeah, it's it's a bummer. Yeah, it is. Well, we mentioned the one time you would want to remove those petals from the calyx is to eat it. And you chose a very delicious recipe to share with everyone, a recipe by Colleen Kadekis, who's been on the show. Um, she came and talked about purple dead nettle. Fabulous creator of recipes. So but I'd love for you to introduce this delicious recipe that we're going to share. Yeah. So I think one year I was just trying to figure out, like, you know, you can get really creative with calendula petals and you can put them on top of your salads and you can freeze them in ice cubes. And I was like, I wonder what they would taste like in just like a baked bake good, you know, because they have a slightly bitter flavor, but it's also slightly floral. Um, and yeah, so I was looking up recipes and I came across this one and I like I fell in love and now I really like to bake with it. Um, I think I mentioned too, too, that I've done like pancakes with them, just like the petals. Um, and so this is a calendula and citrus shortbread cookie. And I know that you're going to share the recipe, but it's basically making shortbread dough and choosing what kind of citrus you want. So you can do like lemon or orange. I've done grapefruit and then mixing in your calendula petals into the dough and then baking your cookies. And it's really simple and it tastes really good and slightly citrusy and a little bit floral, which is really nice. Um, and you can kind of top the cookies, too, with your calendula petals and just really beautiful and a really nice way to to eat calendula. I yeah, I love it. It's so, it feels like celebratory and yeah. just, yeah, gorgeous and yeah. fun. It would be a great, like, summer solstice cookie. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, yeah. It's great. It's They're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you shared a, you gave us so much information about calendula in this very short amount of time. The first day, postpartum, hemorrhoids, acne, uh, lymph, gut. That was a lot. Is there anything else that you want to share about calendula? Mm, I mean, just, you know, have fun, experiment with it. I mean, you can also start with just that oil that I was saying, make make a nice fresh oil um, with the calendula flowers and the calyx, the green part. And then you can put that into salves and you could start there. Or you could put that in suppositories for vaginal atrophy or dryness, you know, or hemorrhoids. Um, diaper rashes, any kind of like all so like all balm, you know, kind of salve for cuts and scrapes and first aid. It's just such a great introductory plant that also builds upon itself as well. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's a great way to express the gifts of calendula. Yeah. I, I go through at least a quart of oil a year. Yeah, um, I'm just like yeah, so I use the oil just like as a face and breast massage oil, and yes. uh, I just I use it almost every night before I go to bed. Sometimes I'll do a combination of Tulsi and calendula. It's kind of my favorite right now. Um, but then my friends, I start getting a lot of requests in the fall of like, oh, what are you doing for the holidays this year? Because that calendula body butter was really nice, or the calendula cream was really nice. So I start, it's like, this one, I get requests a lot for those. So yeah, um, it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that reminds me that there is one more thing um, with postpartum folks, um, any kind of clogged duct or mastitis, mastitis is tricky, right? Because that's where we want to know red flags, there's fevers and infection involved. But with clogged ducts, which is really common, just really painful, or um, newly like breast or chest feeding folks um, using like a calendula oil with maybe some violet um, oil or um, red clover, some other kind of lymphatic, you know, herb is so nice and just really healing to the breast. And I would say pretty breast chest feeding friendly as well. Mm, thank you for that. Yeah. Hey, calendula. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> Well, I'd love to hear more about your farm, Alex. We haven't really touched on that yet. Yeah, so um, Black Locust Gardens, we're located um, outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan in like a pretty small agricultural area um, called Dexter, Michigan. And we cultivate herbs on about seven acres um, 
all seven acres are in cultivation with herbs, I should say. Um, certified organic, and then we also do a plant nursery as well. So we mostly sell online and it's bulk dried herbs. Um, we used to ship fresh herbs and we've kind of pulled away from that because shipping during the pandemic was really chaotic mm -hmm. um, with UPS, USPS um, and the herbs were just not getting there in good quality. So we kind of pulled away from shipping fresh, um, but we do local fresh pickup and we also do um, dried herbs as well, bulk dried herbs. Yeah. What are some of your biggest bulk herb offerings of the dried herbs? Mm. You know, it's all the Nervines. <laughs> so, mm. um, you know, we have lots of Tulsi and lemon balm and nettle um, oats, you know, that are harvested mm. during the milky stage is a really popular one as well. Um, we do have some calendula. Um, and I would say those are probably the, the, most, the most popular ones that we yeah. have. Yeah. Well, lovely. Yeah. And um, seven acres, it's not huge, but that's not small. That's a, that's a lot of land to, to be uh, cultivating herbs. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's, it's, it's cultivated on seven acres, but it's actually a 30 acre parcel. So it's, mm -hmm. we're managing 30, but we're, so we're doing crop rotation throughout oh, all cool. of those acres. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. How wonderful. Yeah. Well, what kind of herbal projects do you have going on these days? Oh, man. So, you know, it's funny talking about like earlier um, nursing school being like, come this way. And the plants were like, come this way. <laughs> kind of happened again just recently. And uh -huh. I was like, okay, I'm going to apply for a nursing program. And then I was like, no, I'm going to open an herb shop. <laughs> so um, that's, that's the newest thing that I'm really, really excited about is opening up um, this herb shop called Bloodroot Herb Shop. And um, the space is, we're hoping, we're kind of envisioning it more than just an herb shop. We're really hoping for it to be a community space. Um, we want it to really feel nurturing um, and a place where people can come and um, buy plants from the plant nursery. They can buy, you know, freshly dried herbs that are, you know, from U.S. grown herb farmers. Um, we're going to do like bi-weekly kind of free classes or sliding scale classes as well as um, sliding scale consultations, um, some outreach for the houseless populations in the area as well, and really just trying to have more mutual aid um, in our community. So maybe coming together and making a bunch of medicine for folks that might need it for maybe um, depending on uh, a protest that might be happening or you know, people that are um, protesting oil pipelines or some something along those lines, trying to really have people come together and make medicine for these for these folks. Wow, what a beautiful offering yeah. for your community. Yeah, it's I'm I'm really excited um, about it. Yeah, yeah. What is the timeline? Like, are you in the dreaming stage now? The envisioning the space stage? We are in the loan got approved looking for a space stage. Oh, wow, that's very yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah, it kind of it happened. It happened pretty fast. Like um, I was thinking about it and I just kept it kept nudging me and I've been wanting to open an herb shop for a really long time. And I just it just felt like the right time with just everyone. I feel like coming out of the pandemic talking about community and how we all want more, you know, but like people don't really know, like there used to be these spaces, like these third spaces where people could go and they could, you know, talk to their neighbors or they could gather and have events. Um, and I think having a baby for me and during the pandemic, it was really, really isolating and there wasn't anywhere to go. And I also really want this space to be really um, open to new parents or any parents that can just kind of come and chat and like be in company with folks. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So now we're looking for that space and we're hoping to open it by the spring. Wow. That is very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Do you think it'll be in Dexter or Ann Arbor or? It's going to be in Ypsilanti, Michigan. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like in between Ann Arbor and Detroit. Yeah. 
Can you do that without showing the mitten? Because Jim McDonald always. Like, it's like I thought it was like a Michigan requirement that you had to show the <laughs> well, mitten. Well, I'm not from Michigan. I'm from upstate New York. So when right, I so here, that's everyone was like, "Here, I'm, I don't know what you're." Talking about. <laughs> All right, you get a pass. Then you get a pass on that. Yeah. No, I don't, I wouldn't be like I don't know somewhere down here. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's still in the southeast mm-hmm. Michigan, um, and it's like 30 minutes from Detroit. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, Alex, I would love to ask you the question that I'm asking everybody for season Mm -hmm. eight, which is what is your most important mistake Mm -hmm. with herbs? I always forget that part, but (laughs) there we could have a lot of mistakes, but we're looking really for some herbal. You've got another two learning mistakes. (laughs) (laughs) You got some time. Um, Boy, you know, this one is really simple. Uh, I kind of, I thought about this and I was like, I could, we could go into some, some deep, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes. Um, But this one, which I think I still chuckle to myself about is what every herb teacher ever told me, which was label your jars. (laughs) Mm. Because you will think that you will remember what's in that jar. You will make something and you're like, I'm not going to forget what's in here. But come like a few months later or a year later, you're like, can't remember what's in that jar at all. And you're like, oh, man, I just have to like toss this because I have no idea what I even put in here. Um, So I would say that it's funny. I still sometimes do that where I am convinced that I'm going to remember what's in the jar and I don't. So a very simple um, mistake, but one that we should all (laughs) keep in mind. I love that you shared this mistake because this <laughs> is so crucial and I have fallen to this even in recent yeah. times. You know, what made a huge difference for me is one, having to throw out a lot of stuff that just was like absolutely silly and heartbreaking because, yeah, I'm just, I don't know what that is. It's, and sometimes it's like, I don't know what it is. And I also don't know, like, how long has it been sitting on this back shelf? You know, it's like I have no memory of it whatsoever. So it's like, yeah, not good. But what happened for me that helped a lot was that I used to like, so I'm like, you know, double Virgo, love everything to be beautiful. And so I had this extensive labeling system that required like going online and creating this specific label for the thing and then printing it out on the special paper. And I don't do that anymore. And not even a little bit. I use craft paper and or not, not craft paper, craft tape. Right. I don't even want the extra like paper tape situation. So I just use like craft tape. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always there. And I have like several around the house and key areas. And so it's always there. So that helped me a lot of just like, okay, I have to let go of, you know, wanting this like beautiful, perfect thing and just do what's easy. Cause other, cause if that's another thing I'll do is I'll be like, oh, when I will say I will remember this. Okay, that's not happening. Um, but then two, I'll say, oh, I'll label this later. I know it's important. Oh, yes, yes. I will label it later. And then, it, you know, then life happens. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I do it all the time. To this day, it happens at least a couple times a year. And I'm just like, why can't I remember? You know, it just it's just like this pattern that just happens and life happens. And yeah, yeah. so. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, I, just, I want to take a vow now. It's like, no yeah, more. That's pinky, pinky brass. <laughs> I'm going to check in with you. Um, I think that's fair. I think that's like fair. over the summer and be like, Rosalie, are yeah. you labeling your jars? <laughs> yeah, it, it helps too as my students, like we make a big deal of it with our students. And so if we don't do it in class, then I often get corrected too. So that helps. Yeah. Well, I think it's good to be held like, accountable. Herb teachers probably, you know, teach that in their herb schools because they're probably still doing it too. Yeah. So and like, we know how painful you have to it stop is. this cycle. <laughs> I do. Oh, that is a very important mistake. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I hope we have like helped a lot of people today. With yeah, this. Know, right? yeah. Otherwise you're just gonna throw it out and it's gonna be sad. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. Well Alex, thank you so much again for making the effort for being here and for sharing your wisdom with Calendula and yeah. um and hearing a bit about your farm too. And of course your most important mistake, all of it has been fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I feel really honored to be here and to, uh, yeah, hear me speak and let me speak and appreciate it. Mm. Thanks, Alex. 
Thanks for being here. Don't forget to head over to the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com to download your beautifully illustrated recipe card and get a transcript of this show. There, you'll also be able to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is the best way to stay in touch. You can also visit Alex directly at blacklocustgardens.com. If you'd like more herbal episodes to come your way, then one of the best ways to support this podcast is by subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks, and I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Also, a big round of thanks to the people all over the world who make this podcast happen week to week. Nicole Paul is the project manager who oversees the whole operation from guest outreach to writing show notes to actually uploading each episode and so many other things I don't even know. She really holds this whole thing together. Francesca is our fabulous video and audio editor. She not only makes listening more pleasant, she also adds beauty to the YouTube videos with plant images and video overlays. Tatiana Rusikova is the botanical illustrator who creates gorgeous plant and recipe illustrations for us. I love them. I know that you do too. Christy edits the recipe cards and then Jenny creates them as well as the thumbnail images for YouTube. Michelle is the tech wizard behind the scenes and Karen is our student services coordinator and customer support. For those of you who like to read along, Jennifer is who creates the transcripts each week. Xavier, my handsome French husband, is the cameraman and website IT guy. It takes an herbal village to make it all happen, including you. Thank you so much for your support through your comments, your reviews, your ratings. I read every review that comes in because they're like a little herbal love letter that brightens my day, like this one. In a blogosphere full of sparkly but dubious herbal remedies and associated claims, Rosalie goes the other way. She provides a usable framework for using herbs that's based on a combination of historical uses, evidence-based research, and attention to the individual. This framework is what helps individuals to select and appropriately use herbs at home in a way that's attainable. Do you love this podcast? If you leave a review for me on Apple Podcasts, I may be reading your herbal love letter on the show next. Okay, you've lasted to the very end of the show, which means you get a gold star and these herbal tidbits. First up, there are so many gifts of calendula and many ways to work with this sunshine plant. If you'd like to hear even more, you can listen to previously released podcast episodes like the one with Cami McBride, as well as a solo calendula episode with me. Another herbal tidbit is that calendula is sometimes confused with marigolds. These are two different plants with similar but also different gifts. The confusion comes around, mm, they kind of look similar, but sometimes the familiar names are kind of crisscross. So sometimes calendula is called pot marigold. It's worth knowing which is which before you choose seeds or harvest. The botanical name for calendula is calendula officinalis and the genus name for marigolds are tegetes. One of my favorite things about calendula in the garden is all the beings that are attracted to those bright flowers. There are sweat bees, which are this electric neon green color. So cool. There's bumblebees, honeybees, hoverflies, and butterflies. So many beings love those calendula flowers. And my last herbal tidbit for calendula is that calendula can be yellow or orange or there are even some hybrids with lots of different colors in their palette. I personally love to grow the orange flowers specifically since they make such a beautiful infused oil. And if you aren't able to grow your own, it's well worth getting them from Black Locust Gardens. You'll be amazed at the quality, which will then make beautiful and potent herbal medicine.